So hello, uh, welcome to Plasma um, 2022. Uh, this is the Department of Media Study at University of Buffalo's um, lecture series. Um, and hold on one minute. Um, uh, this is. Um, sorry, hold on. Well, I'm, um, so welcome to uh, tonight's um, uh, Plasma 2022 lecture um, uh, sponsored by the Department of Media Study at the University of Buffalo, and which is also funded by um, uh, the Office of the Dean of the Arts of College, the College of Arts and Sciences at University of Buffalo as well. Um, and it is curated in collaboration with Spooky Wheel Film and Video Film and Media Art Center, um, as well as the Department of uh, Media Studies here at the University of Buffalo. Um, the lecture tonight um, will be, or we are very lucky to have um, uh, Josephine Anstey, who's a professor of media study here in the Department of Media Studies, uh, <laughs> um, as our speaker tonight. And um, uh, just to let you know, we are recording. So if you do not want your image or um, voice included on the recording, uh, please mute and uh, turn off your camera. Um, so thank you. Um, let's see what else um, there will be. So uh, Professor Jansky lecture, lecture will be for approximately an hour, and then we'll have questions and answers afterwards. And um, uh, I think we will not have a public lecture next week on the 28th of February, uh, but we will be having a class, but not a public lecture. And then we'll, the following week is um, Al Medina's uh, lecture. Um, so without further ado, actually, I'm going to introduce Famous Clark, who is an MFA student in the Department of Media Studies, who will, in fact, introduce his uh, um, faculty member um, and uh, one of his advisors, uh, Josephine Anstey. So I'll let him take it away. Thank you, Paige. All right, hello, everyone. Today we have a very special guest, uh, Josephine uh, Anstey. Uh, she is a professor in Media Studies Department of the University of Buffalo, where she teaches production and analysis courses focusing on game studies, electronic literature, virtual reality, and responsible environments. Uh, she is a uh, professor in the Department of Environment of Sustainability, uh, where she teaches about media and the environment. She has an MFA from the Electronic Visualization Laboratory, University of Illinois at Chicago, an MA from the Women's Studies of American, um, Women's Studies slash American Studies Department of UB, and a BA in English Studies from the University of East, East Angol East Ang Angolia, UK. I'm deeply sorry if I mispronounce uh, th that location. Um, but she's been with the department uh, since, let's see, about 2000. Yeah, uh, she's been with us since the uh, Nazis. So, wow, long uh, longevity, I believe. Her early work includes a long collaboration with uh, Julie uh, Zando on a series of video art pieces. Uh, other early projects include radio documentary, web, and prose fiction. From 1995, she refocused on the production of interactive computer, uh, computer mediated experiences, stories, performances, and games. This resulted in works of interactive drama, virtual mixed reality, and, inter and intermediate performance uh, populated by intelligent agents, networked human actors, and puppet avatars. Between 2001 and 2005, she was part of a group of artists who exhibited network VR projects worldwide on CAVE, system at low cost, cave-like VR systems. Uh, and she's a founding member of the Intermedia Performance Studio at the University at Buffalo, an experimental center for collaboration among media creators, dramatic performances, and computer uh, technologists. And uh, she was my professor uh, in earlier classes. I very much enjoyed her work, inspired me to get uh, to know 
um, taught me to delve into AI generation and uh, narrative driven stories. Uh, so without further ado, we have Josephine Anste. We do. Wait a minute. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much, Famous. Thank you very much, Paige. And thank you very much, Plasma. Um, so what I'm going to do is share my screen with you, but I'm also just going to put into the chat the website, my website, which I will be um, Uh, which I will be sharing so that you can actually follow along on that website, which will be higher resolution. And from there, I'm going to link to some videos, which I'll also put those links in. So you can see <clears throat> those at a higher resolution if you would like. All right, let me share the screen. Okay, and I'm just going to um, make the chat visible in case. Anybody wants to chat? Um, okay. Right. So, <clears throat> uh, for most of my projects, or for all of my projects, where I start from is like the concept. I start with the idea. And for all of my career, I have been interested in questions of consciousness and cognition, how our mind emerges in relationship to other people, uh, to social forces, and then to environmental forces. So I will start with an idea, and then I'll think, what media do I need to realize this idea? Uh, at my first, my first um, incarnation was as a writer. Um, then I worked as a, a script writer and a performer on experimental videos. That was with Julie Zando. Um, then I became very excited about using computers because basically they, they can respond to you. Um, so since 95, I've been creating computer-based projects uh, using VR, AI, robots, game-like things, intermediate performance, and also web-based projects. But there's usually a focus on, an, on narrative experiences, trying to in, engage a, a user in a narrative experience. So um, today I'm going to share um, my process and, and some, something about my process and something about my projects. So the thoughts about the process come in the context of some of the projects. Um, and I'm going to start with um, the thing growing. And you um, watch the video of the thing growing. Um, <clears throat> So people asked about, you know, where does the idea come from? And basically the idea behind this project was to create something about a dysfunctional relationship, the feeling that someone is getting too close to you, they're too controlling, almost as if they're living in you or on you. You can't get rid of them. You need them. You have very mixed feelings. And I first of all, I tried to write this project. I, I was trying to write short stories, but I couldn't write it. I wanted a much more visceral and first person experience. I wanted to make someone feel those feelings and VR seemed like the perfect media. And at that point I had gone to the electronic uh, visualization laboratory, which, which was a, a, an experimental laboratory, um, which had MFA students and also computer science students. And we were all working with cave like VR. Um, so, VR seemed like the perfect media to make an other that would push buttons and make people jump through emotional hoops. Um, because of the cave system, you could make the other as big as the user and you could kind of get up in their face. So um, as you will have seen from the cave VR, a cave system, you know, it's like, it's a room size system. You don't wear the VR helmet on your head but you're in a box and the images are projected on the outside of the box and you wear glasses um, and the glasses put together two images, one for the right, one for the left eye. So you see in stereo 3D, your body is tracked. So the, the, the environment knows where you're looking, knows where you're reaching and what you're touching. Um, somebody asked, when creating a character like this, what kind of thought goes into making it? How did you decide on the voice, body, and reactions? Um, 
So I thought I would actually take you back. Um, I'm clicking now on a link which brings me back to a website, like a hugely, the one of my first websites. So it's very archival. And here, back here is my original storyboard. Um, and so I'm gonna click through the storyboard and you're gonna see that where I started from, I started with the idea. In fact, I had a couple of failed experiments. I made very abstract graphics in this cave environment with no voices and nobody understood what I was doing. So I decided to work with a couple of common sense psychology propositions that we mimic each other and we mimic each other when we like each other. And that dancing is a kind of fundamental form of intimacy. So you've seen the final project and it didn't jump, it didn't go far from this. This is the storyboard that you start on a plane, you go to a shed, the door opens, triggered as you get close to it. Um, there's a box inside, a key appears, the box cut a swoosh, the box opens, um, rocks fly out and then comes the thing. So this was my original artwork for the thing. Um, shouting freedom and I love you and you're, I, I adore you. So the first thing it does is try and make you um, love it. And because it, it flatters you, you dance with it. Um, it does what you want. I'm using motion capture, very, very crude motion capture for the, for the thing. But that meant that um, during the performance, the, the, the thing could mimic what the user was doing as well as the user trying to mimic what the thing was doing. Um, whatever you do, as in so many relationships, you can't please your um, partner, the thing gets grumpy, I didn't use that part, and um, runs away, rocks come out and attack you, the thing saves you, everything's back to, to good again, the thing just wants to dance with you again. You might be getting sick of that by now. And then come the cousins into the environment and the cousins attack you verbally, abuse you, put you in a cage. The thing manages to produce a gun and gives it to you. You can blast your way out of the cage. You can shoot the cousins and then you can choose to shoot or not shoot the thing. So. Um, In terms of 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 the process, uh, it was it was. I mean, I built it. The voice, as you'll realize now, when you hear my voice, the voice of the thing is my voice. Um, there were probably there. Were, I can't remember. At one point, I counted up all the voice files. But basically, the the system has to put together a voice, a motion, and then it has to have a decision structure about the over the top about what part of the story it's in so that would be the right thing to say at this point so um a lot of work went into it it took me years and years to make it also iterative testing you have to test it with people people always always shot the thing in the first few um versions i had and i had to make the thing kind of nicer i had to make uh, the the situation where the cousins were attacking you and the thing you like you're you're not then put together together uh being attacked by somebody else and and gradually i made it i got it to the point where not everybody killed the thing instantly um a lot of a lot of assets uh it took me a long time to make because i also had to learn how to program um, what was it like working with early VR technology? In one word, harder. Uh, now you have Unity 3D or game engines for building virtual environments. Back in those days, uh, not so much. You'll see here, software, hardware, XP, custom programming, performer, cave lib, Bergen. These are all old, uh, old long gone um, uh, pieces of software. And Dave Pate built XP as it's sort of like a prototype of something like um, Unity uh, for us to build this, the scenes in. And the cave allows us to do all this sort of very elementary motion capture. So it took me years to learn. To, and then I had to make very rudimentary AI programming as well. Um, lots of fun, but a lot of work. So moving along, I loved doing the work of capturing motion um, for that, for the thing. 
Um, its body was animated with three trackers, a head and two hands. Um, the choice of having it not joined together was so that you don't run into issues of it not looking good. It just so the, the eye has to finish the body. Uh, it's not done. Um, it's not a fully articulated body like you'd have in a game. So you just have these outline pieces. I think the Wii has that same um, kind of uh, aesthetic. So it's animated with, with but, but it has a lively motion because it's it's animated by a by a person with trackers on them. And then there's a spring system which animated the tail. So now um, a days people have mo motion capture systems where there are many, many, many spots on the body um, and on the face. And in, you know, almost in real time, they can capture body and facial motion, but not so much back then. Um, physics engines now simulate hair, fur and lighting, and, and they're building on those same kind of spring systems from the early days. But in those days, you couldn't do such complex computations in real time. But it was hugely fun to go into the cave and animate the thing. And so I built Pop Up um, to give uh, other people the fun of doing that. And I'm going to uh, share the link to the video. And I'm very sorry, the um, beginning of this is horrifying, but it gets better as we go along. I, I might skip through the beginning. I'm going to play the video. Um, we're going to run it through the disco and we have to tell who are the real people in this disco, i.e. avatars of other real people who are remotely connected to this site in Amsterdam from various sites in the US. Um, you'll also see all these other things dancing, but that's because we can record motion um, and animate the other puppets that are in the environment. So we have avatars that are um, representations of real people, and we have puppets that we can record motion onto. So come along and we'll um, drive through the discotheque. We can drive up this ramp and then we'll be able to record, record motions. These are the tracking sensors. There's only three, one on each of my hands and one on my head. And this puppet moves accordingly. When the puppet is finished, it will go down to the dance floor. Now, um, I can find the puppet I recorded down here, or I can go try and find some of the other real people and see if they'll wave at me. Let's see. Oh, there's one. There's one down here. This, this, here's one here. This is a real, oh, stop, hi. This person is in, I think in Chicago. Okay, I'm gonna follow this guy up. This real person is recording this puppet. That's pretty much it, I think. Um, okay, I, I hope that made sense to people. If there's any questions about that or the thing growing, um, do, do um, put it into the chat.
Um, so essentially that was us. Uh, after after we, we showed it networked, we also just took it downtown for a party and people went and recorded in motion and we had kids from Squeaky Wheel come out and play with it as well. Um, so now Zoom meetings are ubiquitous, but then streaming and sharing of video and sound was in its experimental stages. Um, and also experimental with sharing virtual spaces. So this is like the precursors of, of multi, multi MMOs, multi-user games. Um, but here in the context of people being in cave or cave-like devices. So caves had walls all around and cave-like devices just were maybe one big screen, um, which you entered the virtual environment from. <clears throat> okay, so we'll move along from that to um, the trial, the trail. Um, this will look familiar because it was the project that came before human trials and you, you watched that video, I think. Um, yes, you did. Um, again, this is a, again a narrative project, back to the narrative uh, uh, idea. And if the thing growing was about love, I kind of walked away. Um, the, the, the trial, the trail was about life and death. Um, something about the life instinct and the death drive. Um, I think I put in, uh, it, 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 it was, the idea was to have some kind of a pseudo psychological assessment of people um, given a series of challenges, how do they react? And, and then that, those would be interpreted to see if they're kind of stuck in a kind of controlling narcissistic kind of position. Um, trying to control others, thinking they're the only thing that exists or a kind of sub submissive or, and passive position, not even wanting to exist. So um, I don't really think that everybody is stuck in one or other of these positions, but they're, they're, they're fairly, fairly um, frequent positions for people to get stuck in sort of psychologically in, uh, in relationship to others. So the trial of the trial had a MacGuffin, and like using that Hitchcock term, MacGuffin, um, the, the story well, that gets you into the territory that you're interested in. So in the trial of the trail, the, the MacGuffin was a quest story. Um, and the challenges, we would see how people, and we would interpret the challenges to see how people, how malleable people were, how, how much they procrastinated, how aggressive they were, how protective they were, how submissive they were. Um, the idea was that all the characters should be AI driven. And I, became, I, I started a, a research collaboration with um, AI researchers here um, at, the, at UB. Um, and it, it, it becomes very clear when you work with computer scientists and AI researchers that goals uh, and, and disciplinary assumptions are very different. Um, computer scientists and AI people want to make systems that will work uh, for many, many different um, applications or reasons and artists want to make a unique um, object. And so anyway, I'm just saying this is the beginning of uh, uh, talking about process and how collaborations are difficult. I'm going to show the video um, of um, <clears throat> of this, which will and that's so why I'm putting that in the chat. So I'm going to show this video. It's about four and a half minutes. I'm Philippet. I'm Patafil. We're very I'm pleased to meet you, Caesar. We are your companions on the quest. First, you must pass the night in prayer and meditation at the Holy Chapel. Patafil will attend you. Yes, I will attend you. Keep a silent vigil. Do not leave the sacred hill. Remember, stay on the grassy hill. Stand straight. Contemplate the infinite. Don't leave the hill. <laughs> hmm. 
this is so boring. I'm not going to meditate if you won't, but what can we do? I know. Let's play with these wisps. How you can use our hand. How far can you hit them? Where are you going? Don't go off the mound. It's not safe out there. We need to stay on the sacred hill. Feel that will be so mad if you leave. I'm coming too. Yeehaw! Help me! Look, another one. Hello, little one. Are you looking for us? What are you trying to run off to? Come closer. I'll protect you. You want me to help you find your friend? Don't run away. Miserable little slime. You like to prod. Does that mean you did me? Dirty little hands. Harder, harder, harder. Oh, I'm coming. I'm done. Push off. NFL, it's NFL, and it's getting light. Let's go. What are you doing here? Where's Panther? Where is she? Something's happened to her. NFL, NFL, NFL. Are interactive drama is experienced using a virtual reality system. The graphics are rear projected and usually seen in 3D stereo. We can't show that in this video documentation. There are tracking sensors for head and hand so I can interact with the graphics. So here at my body and then um, you can see my hand looks like a little claw. It's the virtual representation of my hand knocking down the boots. The main protagonist of the drama is the user, me in this case. All the other characters are computer-controlled intelligent agents. Let's play with these wisps. They set up a dramatic situation. They simulate emotions in order to stimulate the user. They aren't always as intelligent as we would like, but we're working on it. Right. So, um... Yes, it was in it, indeed the case that they weren't uh, always as intelligent as we wanted. And over time, it became clear that they would not, the AI, we couldn't get it to work, uh, all of it to work um, all of the time. What worked best was these, these guys. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, these three, these like big, big, I call them the bad guys. Some people call them the Red Kings. And so the, in terms of the AI, they were kind of like a flock and they had to um, they had to uh, cooperate with each other. So there were some quite interesting issues for the AI people to handle. Um, I would note that they handle the decision making structures and I handled the, um, the, the the way those those agents moved about in the space, in the VR space. And that's a huge issue for for games and for VR people. And when you have agents, you have to have them move about space intelligently. And there's, there's really interesting work on that. And people who've played games over the last uh, few decades will know that people, that the, that the no, non-playing characters got smarter and smarter about um, using the environment and, and being spatially aware. 
And so um, sometimes my guys here would just all line up one behind the other. And so it's tricky, but it was really fun. Um, but in the end, we um, kind of realized that although we could get the, the bad guys to work pretty well, and there were a few other of the, of the virtual characters we could get to work, um, we couldn't get Patipil and Philopatu, the two companions on the quest, to work. And that was when we networked um, humans into the loop. And you watched um, human trials. You watched a version of that. So um, there's back here on my, yeah, back in there. Uh, the setup for this, um, the setup for this was to use human beings as the as the um two patophil and philopat the two characters who accompany the uh, user on the quest so in this setup here in the middle is the user and on the right and left are, are actors playing philopat and patophil and then behind that were three screens and an audience watching could see from the three viewpoints of the three um, people in the front, from the user's viewpoint and from the two actors' viewpoint. Um, we had we did we did this in, in in a few different ways. We actually in other versions put the user behind a wall because it was kind of embarrassing, and they were they got embarrassed acting right out in front of an audience. Um, it was fairly chaotic. It was a lot of fun. Um, I don't think we ever quite got. The, the same kind of um, as response from the participant. I don't think it was as moving as the thing growing, but it was it, it was a hugely fun project for everybody to work on. And a lot of people worked on that project. I think back here I have like all the collaborators. And so um, again, there were people with very different disciplines and different expectations. So there were modelers and character builders, there were AI team, there were actors. And um, I just want to, to say it's really rewarding to do these collaborations, but very hard. And people need to respect um, the, and, under, and try and understand the different assumptions from, from people from different disciplines, the kind of ways of working and the norms, even the use of terms can be very different. So there's a, there's a bit of stuff to get through before you can work together. Um, okay, I'm gonna move, oh, wait. We, we don't watch that because you saw it already. Okay, so the next one we're going to look about look at is Boyubu. And you read about this. And this was the most complicated collaboration I was ever involved in. Um, it involved uh, three departments from UB, Media Study, Computer Science, and the Theatre and Dance Program. We also involved the Department of Computer Science at Canisius College and the Real Dream Cabaret, which was an experimental performance troupe, plus some you know, classically trained actors that actually I think had uh, at that point um, graduated from UB. My role in this was as instigator. I worked on the script. I worked on some of the game aspects and some set dressing. And I can't claim much credit, credit but it was an amazing project to be part of. And Sarah Beijong from Theatre and Dance, uh, who was a professor here, then was the director. Um, if you, um, you've already read about the project, but to summarize, um, we took two 19th century plays and somebody said, well, why did you do this? And uh, I guess in a moment of frenzy, talking about what we wanted to do, somebody brought up Ubu as an interesting play. And then we thought Boychek would be an interesting play. And we ended up mashing them together. Um, and we added green screens, virtual sets, surveillance cameras, two and 3D gaming, live actors, puppets, robots, sound, lights, and live performance. Um, it ran for three weekends in a space we rented downtown. Um, and this is the space, and I drew some light, some stuff all over it. Um, the wall was down the middle. Audience came in here. Um, some audience members sat and watched the Boychek play, which was um, fairly straight. It was two actors 
taking all the roles in the play. In fact, one actor was Boychek and the other actor took all of the other roles um, in a story that was about a downtrodden soldier who was abused and experimented on by a doctor and he was kind of driven mad and eventually killed his wife. Um, on the other side, uh, his in, in the terms of the play, his hallucinations kind of, which were projected here on the wall, were um, they came from the other side of the wall and came from the other play. There were projections here and here, and this these projections and th both projections talked about the Boychek play were, were sets, virtual sets for the Boychek play, until there was an eruption or interruption from the other side of the wall, and the Ubu play would start up. And so, in in the Ubu play, which is a play about a king who um, a, a thug who becomes a king, the king of Poland, and then he loses his kingdom to Russia. Uh, the, the antics over here were all projected through the wall onto the, to the screen here. And there will be a green screen with actors and puppets. Um, the robot wars took place here. There were PCs here with games on that. And the audience members took part in the wars, they they were they were they were dragged in to act with the actors and they played the games. Back here was the tech crew. I'm going to show you the movie. It's very short and very chaotic. Uh, I'm going to put the link into the chat for those who wants to just play it on their own computer. Well, it is a beautiful day here in uh, Poland, which is to say nowhere. So I see the good King Wenceslas and his dashing son are taking their places. <laughs> this is absolutely astounding. The King of Poland lies dead at my feet. When I rest at the window after a rain, Let's move it back there. Enough of this. Bring out the chest for a
All right. Um, so hopefully having read about that, uh, that will make some sense to you. Um, I just want to reiterate the fun it was, but the difficulty when you have actors who have the, the norm is that they rehearse every night intensely for weeks and computer scientists like don't do that. They, they work very slowly for years. And, and then um, media study students, I guess I have to adapt to everybody, but it was like a really, um, it was a very interesting seeing everybody having to sort of like understand how different disciplines work. And um, in this instant, I think that there came to be an incredible respect for everybody, for everybody else. Um, uh, including all, all of these these folk and then the, somebody who came in quite late in the day and kind of did a sound thing sound that's got to make everything make sense uh and link everything together so um we will go on uh if there are any questions please put them in i uh, i there was a question i was meant to answer here or well, maybe it's a bit later um oh no it was here because somebody asked a, a, a question about, you know, the question about live performers versus NPCs. And you've got to admit that human beings are great uh, performances. They, they, they can adapt, they can change. So they're wonderful. And I think the AI community want to make NPCs that good. Um, challenges, people ask about the challenges for VR. I, and I, I think for computer games in general is, is AI does remain a huge challenge. I think we can all see that um, if you want to take the route towards um, photorealistic visuals, that game games are kind of getting there right now uh, in terms of lighting and the physics, et cetera, et cetera. And AI characters, even that have you know good spatial awareness, um, language still remains a problem. I, I think it's it, it, it's always sort of just around the corner. The, the agent that will really uh, flexibly understand and respond in um, in the right kind of language. Um, I, I think that will that I think that that will change too. Um, the potential for VR, obviously, in some ways, is that, is that more senses will be supported. Um, even back back in those days, people were doing experiments with haptic, which is touch haptics and with scent and obviously all all surround sound was was there but it, all these things are pretty tricky um especially if you don't want to have an awful lot of expense and a lot of gear hanging off you um the other part of the challenge is to have you know is the is the aesthetic challenge you know what of, of, of a responsive sort of uh, it, it couldn't be a storytelling system, but, but it can do other things as well. And I think obviously VR and the g games and VR games are doing a better and better job at getting into very serious ter territory. Um, but like film and independent film, I think there's always a place for experimental VR. I mean, there's sort of film, independent film and very experimental film. And I think there can be, you know, mega mainstream VR independent VR and then absolutely experimental VR. And, and you know, it's not just VR because you go into AR and mixed media and, and, and all of these other things. Um, so I think VR is a great medium, can be a great medium for luring people into explanation, explorations of the self, psychological, social, uh, psychological and social. Um, but the self and, and the mind, and explorations of the mind, we've got to remember the mind is not a stable thing. Um, somebody wrote, what will happen? I don't know, I, I, I cut the their quote out of context, but so, something to the effect of what will happen uh, or will brain computer interface have an impact on people's multiple brains and nerves? So I love, I love that phrase. Um, I'm going to repeat it. Will the brain computer interface have an impact on people's multiple brains and nerves? I love that. I, I like the assumption that we already have multiple brains. Um, 
And so the question I think is on a lot of people's minds is what is the mind? What is the person in the metaverse? And I, I don't know if I have any answer to that at all. I would love to talk about it more. But the next project I want to talk about here is all about how the mind might have changed in the past and speculations on how it might change in the future. And this is, I'm jumping over that one. This is imp calm improvising consciousness. Um, you read about this project as well. I've always, uh, I developed actually an interest in the relationship between consciousness and the environment. Um, improvising com consciousness went on as a project for many years and in many connected and disconnected pieces. Uh, started as performance and workshops and ended up online as a sort of hybrid story somewhere between creative nonfiction and science fiction. Um, the conceit of it all is that consciousness and cognition changed radically as humans developed. And I mean, as humans developed over, you know, millions of years. Um, and that the, and that, um, the conceit is that it will also change radically in the future um, and that it needs to change if we are to survive the current threats to our environment. Uh, the project stresses embodiment. It, said, it doesn't think that we have an abstract mind that could be just offloaded to something else, but that we have a very concrete mind in a very concrete body that it developed on a particular planet under particular environmental circumstances. So I'm going to put the link to the Imcom website here. Um, I'm, I'm ignoring the chat. Uh, I'm going to put a link to the website here and I'm going to just play just a very quick teaser, which kind of vaguely explains something about what's going on in this uh, universe. I'm actually going to just show it in this little window, so it's very small. For hundreds of thousands of years, visually based analogical thinking develops. At enormous expense and with incredible technical sophistry, Professor Jennifer Ornstay and her team have fabricated a habitat for a real live Dobby alien. To survive, they invent a metaphor of mind space. Yes, the I struck mind, your very own language based consciousness takes the stage. Participants are invited to plumb the depths of an alien mind by playing the mysterious direct access to knowledge sharing and decision making is restored to the visual processes of the brain. All right, so the on the website, I mean, the basic story is that this woman Professor Jennifer Armstead, who's my alter ego, comes from somewhere and she's come, she probably comes from the future. She claims to be pan-temporal. She's come here to explain uh, and to try and urge people to, that they need to, not to worry too much, that their minds are going to change enough for us to actually survive um, the, the radical uh, dislocation to the planet, to the, the environmental disasters that we are imposing on it. And, and she does this by, by going way back into the past and talking about the very first mind we had, which she claims is um, visually based. Uh, way before, humans are, are as intelligent as humans are now, but language was not yet invented. And she goes through and talks about a moment when we had a bicameral mind. We had language, but it was very different and we didn't have consciousness. We had uh, the right side of the mind, which is like a God voice telling the left side of the mind what to do. Um, and then we move on to the moment where um, we get actually a linguistic consciousness, the kind of consciousness that we're, uh, that we're used to. And then she goes off into the future and says we're going to have different minds in the future. 
And as well as the lectures, there's the cognitive exercises. And these were originally um, live workshops and performances. Um, but this is where people are urged to try the exercises. And this is where if you do the exercises, you might be able to at least get a glimpse of a different mind configuration. Of, um, of, of the kind of mind that existed in the past. Um, this, is, this tries to get you to have uh, an understanding of a bicameral mind. And so there's a video instruction and then um, uh, a set of instructions of how you do it and how you're going to arrive at having a bicameral mind. And then a, an audio, which you have to listen uh, with headphones so you get in, uh, sound to the right side of your brain and sound to the left side of the brain. Um, and then there's uh, another one is the Davian bead game. And here the um, Professor Anste claims that inside this tank is an alien consciousness that only works visually. And you interact with the alien consciousness by playing a game, um, which is actually pushing glass. They look like glass beads. You push them about on the screen and then here um, there is a monitor that shows the Darby, the, the aliens called the Darby, but the monitor shows the Darby's response to you. So um, the history of consciousness kind of does, does um, use existing um, scholarship about uh, how, how human consciousness developed and how it could have been very, very different. And of course, the science fiction Future parts um, are just science fiction. Um, so you can see there's very much a connection uh, in terms of these cognitive exercises. Again, there's a sort of an attempt to sort of make the interior of someone's mind the stage. And, uh, and, and you get to that by an interface which includes their body, um, just as we try to affect the person's emotions with a thing growing. Here, I, I want to try and destabilize your sense of what it is to have a mind at all. Um, again, there was a huge team of people who worked on this over the years, uh, different, different things that they did. Um, and, and there's this whole website with everything on it. So I think I'm going to probably stop there. And um, I'm really excited to answer any questions. And um, and that's it. Yes, I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you want to, you can um, unshare your screen, and then you'll be censored. Um, great, wonderful. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for that, and uh, kind of um, moving us through your trajectory. Um, as an artist in your thinking um, and ending on helping us think about our thinking. Um, uh, so I guess I'm wondering if there are questions in the chat and Samus is going to uh, curate the, the conversation. Yeah, if, if you guys have a question, uh, you can type it out or raise your hand uh, and I'll give a Quick second, if not, I do have questions for that you guys submitted that I will propose to uh, Josephine. So I'll give a quick second for you guys to uh, raise your hand. Josephine, do you, do you want to share a little bit about how you see the world of experimental uh, VR uh, historically, right? Because you really situate yourself in the in the history of people in VR really working with alternative, you know, different approaches to narrative and different approaches to, so who were your collaborators in that kind of the realms of experimental VR? I guess it was all experimental in the beginning, right? So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, I, I guess we were quite, we worked with people. Um, what I did was very different than what everybody else did. Um, at, at the Electronic Visualization Laboratory, I was the only person, it's a little bit, the clue's a little bit in the name, visualization. Everybody else was a visual artist and wanted to make 
you know, really, you know, they just thought the VR environment that this surround, this immersive environment was an incredible place for making um, visual visualizations, for visualizing things. For uh, and, and so people did very, very different things. I was one of the very few people doing narrative back then. Um, my professor was Professor Dan Sandine, who was... Uh, the person who invented the image, the Sandine image processor, which was like the beginning of sort of video art. It was taking that video signal and playing with it. He was an experimental artist. He, his background was in physics. He was dyslexic. He hated the word. And when I come along with wanting to make stories in virtual reality, he had a he had a toxic reaction. His um his life history had been the history of film, which had started out as like this wonderful uh, experimental um, uh, medium. He, he, he loved people like Hollis Frampton, um, and he thought it had been spoiled by Hollywood and the imposition of story structures. So when I came along wanting to impose story structures on VR, he, he, won, he, he, he was incredibly supportive he supported me all the way he was like he, he it, not the first year the first project I did it at the, there was a I did a little I, I I used a computer to make a little worm thing like it was like three lines wiggle about and then there was a thing that looked like a staple that chased it saying I smell you I smell you and and after viewing my first um work which was very disturbing he said, you have to actually come to terms with the word visualization in the electronic visualization laboratory. So there weren't, I, I think, I think what happened really was, was people developed very, very different. Back then, it wasn't so hard to get easy to get your hands on VR stuff. So you had to be in very specific places. So uh, many of those people developed really wonderful kind of visual environments um, that would just be surreal um, and, and disturbing, but 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 not storytelling. Um, I remember talking to an to an artist back then, and uh, she's a famous she's a Steiner for Solko. What for my work, and she said, "Oh, you do realize that everybody who doesn't care about narrative, you completely lose with this kind of work." So so so. <laughs> Uh, I think it was only when games really came along and they, they, they became much more. And I think the modern games have sort of, and VR games and games in general have, have sort of run with the storytelling side of things. Um, and I think not just, you know, not just very simple stories, but I think quite complex stories and stories where, where there is a lot of emotional depth. Yet still, I think there's room for more experimental stories. Did that answer you, Paige? It didn't really. No, no, you, that was exactly what I was asking for. So perfect. <laughs> uh, there is a question from, I believe the first person up is uh, Jeremy, uh, I'm sorry, Jeremy Steinmark, if you want to unmute yourself. Hello. Hi, Jeremy. Um, um, it was uh, very interesting here we had to say about this stuff because it's one of the fields I was like thinking about going into. Um, do you, how far do you think virtual reality will be? Will it be a, like more of a stay more in the Oculus Rift standards or go to as far as of a lot of sh like shows talk how, sh how shows like I'm going to use the word anime shows that deal with virtual reality? Um, I, I don't think there's any doubt that it will, it, you know, when I was, when I was, you know, back, back in the day, there was the holodeck. It was on Star Trek and the holodeck was you, you go into the virtual environment or, or, or the matrix. You go into the virtual environment and you don't know you're there. It supports your sense, every sense that you have. So there you are in it and you just think you're um, uh, in. It's just as good, just as good, just as real as reality. And I, I, I think that's something that people are going to go on trying to make. Um, it's difficult because. There are many, many clues, you know, the, our, the resolution of the real world and, the res and our ab ability to, to pass through our perceptions, the real world is, you know, this, it, you take a lot of computing power to, to, to make that happen. But I don't think there's any doubt people will try and do that. Um, 
I think there will be other people who find that that, you know, just as there are people who want to make films and there are people who want to make animation, which is not the same, there will be people who want to do something else with VR. And I think there were many questions people asked about the metaverse. And I think, you know, we've we've had in our imaginations, we've had the metaverse since sort of William Gibson and Necromancer, which is sort of where Matrix comes from. Um, that there will be another another layer of reality. And I, I don't see why there shouldn't be. Um, people think it might be dangerous. People will be addicted to it. And mm, yes, maybe, maybe so. People are addic- can easily get addicted to a lot of things. But I don't think that necessarily means it shouldn't happen. Um, I think there's a case to be made. Maybe it's a tricky case, but that, that if we all move some of our desires for consumer goods to virtual consumer goods, we will be using up less resources on the world, except you do need a lot of computing power and to, to make those uh, virtual resources. Yeah, I think a good example of like, a better, a better example that you, you, might, you probably will know is Ready Player One. I saw that mentioned many times and I don't know, I actually don't know it. The basis of the movie is that they, it takes place in the near future where they have VR has become to a point where people will really feel like they're transported to another reality. It's everything's real in a way. That's yeah. what I was talking about. More of like, will we eventually reach that? Oh, or I, will we reach, yeah. Remain I, stagnant of like more of the VR, more of no. the Oculus Rift. No, it will not stay stagnant. You know, the Oculus Rift came along. You know, there's people behind the Oculus. There's 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 other systems running up behind that that will be better. I, I think there's no doubt of it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, we have a uh, question from Dino. Uh, I, I do not know how to say your last name, unfortunately, but I will read out your question because you have asked me to. Uh, so for Josephine, um, when virtual reality was in its infancy, the uh, polygonal renderings could sometimes fall into the uncanny valley, uh, far more basic than the high definition visuals we can get on VR today. In the early days, were there people who were hostile towards the medium who felt it created a unnatural environment? Uh, no, I, love, I love this question. Um, it took a long time to get anywhere near the uncanny valley. Uh, the early days, the, the, the amount of um, pixels and polygons and triangles and textures that a computer the size of a refrigerator could put out would, wouldn't get you anywhere near um, the, the kind of high definition photorealism that, that causes the uncanny valley. And now when you look at, um, I think I saw back there, um, that somebody talking about Boba Fett and somebody... Luke Skywalker in Book of Boba Fett was completely CGI, young Mark Hamill using, yeah. I mean, I think, um, what, what am I trying to say? I just distracted myself. But um, people were not, I mean, people are always hostile. There, there, there are the people who want to make, make things in this new um, medium. And they would just do what they could to make it happen. And then there are always people who are very fearful of new media and think it will um, it will be very dangerous. And that's been the case since print medium came along and people thought the, the novel was going to um, make women disobedient and let's not teach African-American people taken into slavery to read. And so, you know, at every stage, it's always somebody out there, somebody usually who we want to keep power over. We want to make sure they don't do something with this new medium. And I don't know. I, I think obviously things will change. Obviously people will adapt. Um, but I don't, I think it's not necessarily useful just to assume that the metaverse <laughs> is going to be all evil. I, I also don't think it's necessarily uh, good to assume it won't be evil, but um, I think um, these, this, it's like the metaverse, uh, you know, 
I, as I'm imagining it is like we will all go out and be able to like you know if somebody put here they want to be able to stroke their what was it Bulbasaur in their Pokemon and really feel that frog like yeah that sounds like that doesn't sound bad to me it doesn't sound bad to me that when we when we do networking in the future um my family is in England and I have two new nephews one in England one in Sweden it, it sounds good to me that I might be able to touch them in some way across the the um across the network um I think the thing that's important for us as humans now is to sort of figure out technologies that will maybe keep us connected and let us use up less resources in the world. Awesome. Uh, Dino, I hope that answered your uh, question. Uh, okay, we have four questions. Good. Yep, thank you. We have four questions coming in. Uh, one um, is from uh, Dr. Cody Meyer. And uh, ah, that, that is more of a comment, but I, 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 I will add a tagline. Uh, it, does it seem that our perception of virtual reality uh, is more dystopian with novels like Necromancer or Do We Dream of Electronic Sheep or the Ready Player One? I, I hope that's not too far off your comment, Dr. Cody. I I love that. Yeah, I yeah. I guess Necromancer kind of had its dark side, and 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 Do We Dream of Electric Sleep? But I I I I, I think. Okay, I I'm in two. I'm in totally two minds about all of this. I mean, there's the, the there's the this the part of me that's just like, oh yeah, let's go full steam out into this brave new world, and it could be just like the most fun. Um, and I think that's 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 absolutely true. Um, yet yet we would be naive if we didn't see that every time we develop a technology, you know every every time a new media comes along, it's also used in, in ways that are horrifying. So um, I think that's just something that has to be negotiated. Um, I'm not one to advocate stopping things because there might be difficulties, but I, I do think, and I'm gonna just say it again, I do think the, 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 the issue now is how to make technologies that will help us um, maintain ourselves on the planet as opposed to and i'm not i'm not i'm not really pro those technologies that say let's shoot off to another planet and destroy that one i think it might be good to try and figure out ways to make this planet work uh first and i'm not really interested and i find i find kind of very odd and dystopian the the ideas that will be post-human that will just like upload our consciousness to something else um i think we have that underestimates how embedded we are in these bodies on this planet and um, that we haven't come to, we have to come to terms with that a little bit more. If we can survive as a species for the next three or 400 years in these bodies on this planet, then I think we should, then, we, then, then maybe we can uh, upload ourselves to another metaverse. Awesome. awesome. Uh, I hope uh, that wasn't too far off your comment, Dr. Cody, if you, would like to interject, please feel free. I want to answer Nikoli Elizabeth Jimenez's question. Do you want to read it, famous? I, I totally can't. I, I think Dr. Cody wanted to speak for a second. Oh, or? No, I was just gonna say yes, famous. It, it did. My 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 mind was that total like academic thing where it was more of a comment than a question. So sorry about that. I was just sort of noting that like someone brought up Ready Player One, right? It's kind of conspicuous to me that like. Well, there has been for a long time this dream of VR as like, oh yeah, this will be the metaverse, right? We'll go into it, it will be great, it's gonna be wonderful. And then more and more, I think that's changing to maybe a more of a cynical view or like there's uh, there are some of these dystopias now, I think that are in the public imaginary related to VR, right? Like that, well, maybe this isn't good. Maybe this would just be, you know, Zuckerberg or, or like owning our souls for eternity or something or you know whatever that looks like but anyway yes it got to my um uh it got to my question slash comment thank you and, and I love that idea of Zuckerberg owning our souls I think that's a uh that's something to be worried about well the things to think about for the future uh but for the question of Nikolai uh Elizabeth uh Jimenez 
uh, why did you decide to create a coercive relationship between the thing growing and the user? Uh, did you ever think to make the user the antagonist of the story and not the thing? Thank you very much for that question. And that's actually something that somebody else asked about. It's like, how do you do this? How do you do these VR things? How do you... Um, Mm, I'm looking for that point. But how do you how do you how do you make something in a system that has to be responsive? Uh, because somebody might not do what you want them to do, and so um, uh, and, the, and and that that is part is one of the reasons why the thing is in control and not the user. Because if the user is in control, I can't I can't. I don't know what they're gonna want. I can't program it. But if the thing is in control and and I limit what I let the user do, hopefully yeah, enough that they don't really notice what I'm doing, then I can make enough, um, I can program enough alternatives. So it's a programming issue uh, at one level. At another level, because it was the story I wanted to tell was about, or, or the experience I wanted to produce was about was 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 a was about being in an uncomfortable relationship where you don't have all the power. Um, so I think a lot of people um, experience that in their lives, and it's uh, and I do think VR is a place where you can play out some of those um, dis, uh, dysfunctional and uncomfortable relationships. And people uh, actually, some people ask, uh, is it used in counseling or is it used in trauma therapy? And yes, VR is used in all of those things because of this possibility that you can maybe lead somebody through a trauma in a more safe space. Um, I was doing it for uh, literary purposes, but people use it for counseling purposes. Awesome. Uh, and I believe I messed up the name, uh, I believe it's Nicole. I do apologize for that. Um, so we'll go um, Ivan, Andrew, and then Matthew. So Ivan, did you want to unmute or would you like me to read your comment? Oh, uh, sorry. I just was trying to find a mute button. Uh, so uh, I asked, uh, what difficulties do you recall during uh, early development uh, and testing for user to avatar interface? Because um, I, I thought it was a little bit interesting where um, like how how how's like developments kind of gone like to the course where like uh you had um your example through the videos and um and then like for from like kind of like my point of view i see like oh it goes to like the wii and then after the wii we have like uh vr start coming out like i find i kind of find like a gap in between that time that i'm like oh what happened with development was there no more development or anything oh okay i I think I, I get the, I think, I think, uh, so this would be my, my, my experience. And this is only coming from what I know. Um, mm -hmm. In 95, I went to the University of Illinois where they had the cave and the cave at that point cost, you know, it was a million dollar proposition, given uh, the hardware and um, the computers. And as I said, they were, huge they were called things like reality monster and this the reality monster could pu push out as many pixels as you probably can push out on your um phone or less um and then when i left chicago i came to ub and i created with pcs a, a, like a vr system we still had the tracking system and we had a uh, stereo 3D, but we didn't have enough money for a cave. So we just had one wall, but we had sort of everything else working. And then I think um, we, we could do that because by that time, gaming PCs had come out with enough poly, you know, enough power to push polygons so that we could have a real time um, virtual environment. And then I think everything moves over into the game industry. I mean, all the money, all the thinking, goes into the game industry and people are, are people and VR took a sort of dive at that point because it was so expensive that you couldn't you could just about cobble together for a, as much as it would cost you to buy a car maybe uh, a home VR system but that's still a lot so people mm. artists did use it but um I think a lot of people um coming out of schools 
you know, went into the games industry and then there were all those work, all those things you could do there, the modeling, the, the what would become later rigging skeletons um, and the motion capture, all of those industries grew up. And, and then, so that's where sort of 3D real-time graphics went. And then only in the last, again, maybe I can't remember, uh, when the, the cheaper VR things started to come out and people started to use the game them for games, but but I think it, it, at the risk of, of being sounding cynical or, or, or this not being an appropriate thing to say, you know, a couple of things drive media. Um, three maybe war war drives media, porn drives media, um, games drive media. So those are where where the the, the, the changes and the new things happen. And then the, the people, the experimental people kind of grab things around the edge and, and do do whatever they want to do with them. Uh, okay. Yeah. Because like, to, to my knowledge, I, I just like, it, it just kind of like blanks out for me. It's like, oh, you had, um, because like, I, I understood in like, uh, around like, uh, in my high school days, um, I, I kind of just like, looked at vr i'm like oh it's, re it's really interesting how like it was like big hulky machines and then they went to kind of like we where it's like uh one, one tv screen and then they get the controllers to to uh for the interface for the people to avatar and then um and then it just kind of like stopped there there, there was i didn't really see any like vr development and like uh in high school they had like this like uh this they, they, they tried to do like a, like this like cheap vr thing with like the cardboard box mm -hmm. that you just put over your face with like your phone on it and then like now it's uh all of a sudden around like 2019 or 20 a lot a lot of people just start have like vr sets they had it, um they're able to play games with it and i'm like oh where did this development kind of come from so i was just curious from your point of view if oh i mean if you think about it yeah well i think in the background all of that was going on but i think it really i think a lot of the money and thinking and brain power went just into the game industries head on and vr did take a dive and mm -hmm. then and and as it's revived i think it's revived in two places it's revived in the games industry but also there's a, a huge in, a huge interest in um vr films now that mm -hmm. are sort of playing with you know 3d cameras and i think that's you know very exciting and interesting development as well uh, okay yeah thank you for your insight i'm not gonna, i feel bad taking up so much of other people's time so uh Thank you for your opinion. Have a good day. You too. Awesome. Uh, I, I, Ivan, I do encourage you to take a look at the comment button in the chat if you're so inclined. Uh, next, we have Andrew J. Wilson, who would you like to unmute or I will read your comment. And... I can unmute. Um, hi. So, uh, yeah, I... Um... I'm not sure if this is something you can answer, but I was trying to say like I'm um very interested in like looking to like VR production for my future and like one of my um one thing I'm really interested in in the realm of VR is um actually like uh, in viewer like VR videos and film and I'm I'm not sure how much experience you have with this, but um no, I, I don't even know what you really mean by that like um just using um like 360 videos and 360 film in the headset as like just trying to clarify from the kind of dual use of vr in um like uh in, in the fingering and uh actually i think that's a really great question and i think there's there's a way in which just the, the modern 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 a, there is a sort of way in which these two things are coming together. Because if you, <laughs> I can show you, I can show you um, 360, um, 360, not exactly VR, but 360 uh, environments back, back in the, oh, back in those, back pre-2000, pre there was a guy, French Canadian guy that, 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 that did a project and you would, um, it was video, a video project and you would be, there would be four screens all around you. It was set in a park and, and you were kind of at a crossroad and, and, and you looked on each screen, you saw video of, of the park and it was interactive because things could come up. And it, so it had the, 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 the computers were cutting and splicing video. Um, and then he had a bicycle. He used to drive his three D his um, 360 cameras around. And in fact, in this very, um, 
application, I remember you could, somebody would come up on one VR video screen and say, do you, and this is video, do you want to come biking through Montreal with me? And you would apparently get on the back of the bike and go off um, riding through um, Montreal. So I think now, um, obviously, you got to you got to remember that there are some really different characteristics between 3D models and 3D environments and um, film, film and video, film and video throw away all of the 3D information. And to get that back is quite a difficult thing. And I remember there were projects back in the day where if you do two passes of video, you can claw back the depth information from video. But I, I don't I haven't followed that that um, those trajectories, but you can see that the that in the film industry, radically they are putting together um, real environments and virtual environments almost seamlessly. They're not doing it in real time, or completely seamlessly. Seamlessly for me, I'm not very good at noticing these things. They don't usually do it in real time, but they're pushing the boundaries of doing it in real time. Um, I'm not sure if that's the answer, but I think all that comes together. I think all that comes together in the future and, and in the near future. All right, thank you so much. Awesome. Uh, next up, I think, uh, in line is Matthew Luke. Hello. Hi. Um, first, I love uh, movies like with CGI characters, like um, Transformers and Planet of the Apes, where like, um, you know, like there's there's a lot of emotional connectivity to those type of characters, even though they're CGI. So two of them are they're not uh, even human. One's a robot. One's a, a monkey. But I'm really impressed with like the micro expressions that make them very like real. Like um, that, like uh, there's a scene in Transformers The Last Night, which isn't my favorite movie. Um, I love the first four, but Transformers 5, I didn't like the editing, it was too short. So I felt it should have been longer, it should have felt. Um, there's a scene that I do love, even though I hated the entire movie. It's when um, the character Optimus Prime is um, feeling hopeless. Like he um, he's sort of given up. And like, um, there's like a lot of body language in it. Like, um, first he's he says, "I have failed you. I have doomed Earth. Earth, the only place in the universe whose people let me call it home." And then uh, Cade, who's a live actor, is like, "We can't do this without you because without you, we'd all die." And then um, Optimus, it's the body language. First he's kneeing, and then like he gets up like this. Like first his eyes, when he's kneeing, his eyes are looking down. And then like there's like a look of passion in his eyes even though he's a cgi character and he's a robot like there's a look of passion in his eyes when his eyes rise up then he then he does a speech like my brothers i will never betray you again to save earth and her people we must go to cybertron and steal quintessa's staff like you know like it's a, do you think like there's um it it proceeds to like stuff like audio with the recent luke skywalker stuff um there is going to be like further appearances of CGI Luke. So like, do you think that there's those two characters, they still had voice actors, you know, humans to elicit that emotion. Do you think that computers will somehow elicit emotion through audio? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think computers can elicit emotion. I think even the word, word processing program thinking in the wrong moment elicits emotion. I think we're, we're I, 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 I just think um, uh, obviously it's, it's very exciting to see the um, degree to which computers can and CGI can um, create photorealistic effects. Um, but the other thing to remember is that human beings don't actually need photorealistic effects to think that something's alive. Uh, I went many years ago to a conference and it's about what they call in VR presence, the, 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 the feeling that you're present in an environment and that the other people are present in it too. And it can be a very um, limited visual and even audio environment. And I, I think 
we we can still feel very present in it because and it's something to do with the way humans are wired to 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 fill in the gaps um and i think we we understand that as part of our uh, really early development of um perceptual and um cognitive systems because we have to you know you 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 will have heard all of those those stories about you know you need to be you need to you will see in a dark room a jaguar because because if there was a jaguar you would need to be able to see it so that we fill we fill stuff in um so i think it's really interesting this kind of relationship between um what we perceive what we need to perceive um and um, the virtual environments that people are making and the virtual characters. And I, I, I would be, I think it's really exciting to think about some of those um, animal and robotic characters, because I think, again, I'm gonna hop on my own, my, the same theme, for, for, for human beings to, to, to survive, um, you know, and, and live and flourish on the planet, they have to get into a relationship with animals and maybe machines that that's less, maybe less selfish, maybe less, you know, we are the masters. I, I think, I think, so I think it's great if you're moved by a robot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Have a good day, night. Okay. Fantastic. And we have uh, Joe, Joseph, uh, hey, uh, your last name is cut off on my screen. Uh, do, would you like to unmute yourself and speak your question? Yep, my unmute was working for a second. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, sorry, I was listening and I kind of forgot my question. I think it was something along the lines of, so, so there's a lot of great old video games and I just feel like a lot of uh, recent VR games that come out, uh, excluding a couple uh most of the VR games that came out, uh, they're very experimental and like, it's like, oh, it's VR. So ex excuse, you know, this and this and this. And it's kind of interesting because a lot of, uh, a lot of older video games, it was, <clears throat> sorry, can you go back and like uh, simply use the old video games and change them into a VR uh, game or is that do you have to recreate the entire game uh, from scratch when that's done? Um, well, I think this comes comes down to what you consider to be VR and back in those cave times um, people considered that you had to have an immersive system so that your peripheral vision wouldn't be distracted by things outside of the VR. So it has to be a, a, a big enough screen or a cave. You had to have a tracking system so that the virtual environment moved when you actually moved your physical body. And I think it would be it would probably not be impossible for some team of dedicated programmers to go back and say, I wanna you know, grab, grab the assets, I wanna grab the, the, the levels from this old game and make them into a VR uh, environment. But I don't, I don't think it would be an out of the box, you know, push the button solution. I think it would be a lot of work. So it's, so it's kind of a not right now type thing, definitely in the... I think it, I think I think it's not right now. And if you if you said to somebody do it now, they say, "Oh, it'd be easy just to redo it," or um, rather than try and it'd be easier look, look back into the old code and the you know computer code and computer programs become obsolete very very quickly. All the stuff, <clears> that, <throat> all the tracking materials, tracking kind of software we used back then, it, it became up. That was mostly the reason we we we, we stopped. We had a. a big flat screen VR system at, U, at media study, but the tracking, we, we couldn't maintain the tracking system. Now, again, there are new tracking systems and I think Dave Pape and um, the VR group are, are using the, the, new, the, new, um, the, new, the new VR helmets and the new VR systems and, and starting up again. But, but 
getting back those old games. People do it for love, but it's uh, it's tricky. Uh, that, that, that's a shame because a lot of those old games would be awesome to experience like in, you know, in a headset, in a helmet, uh -huh. mainly thinking of Halo. But uh, thank you for answering my question. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions queued, queued up unless someone had one that they were thinking about. Uh, if not, I do have more questions that you guys wrote ahead of time. Um, unless, Paige, you wanted to. Let's just take one more. Um, famous. Yeah. If you want to just pick one. Cool. Okay. Uh, 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 Josephine, this question comes from uh, Jamie uh, Leisner. Uh, and the question is, uh, my question is, how much do you think VR will become integrated into everyday life? Will, will it remain something that only some people own or will it become uh, more basic and uh, ubiquitous? Um, I think quite a lot of people asked this question sort of about the future of VR. Um, And I do think it will become fairly ubiquitous. I think it will become as normal as phones. I think I think things will blur together a little bit. You know, what is CGI? What is what is three sixty video? Um, it will become. It's hard to know quite how it will become like that because I think the promise. It's a little bit like the promise of AI. It's always like next next year it'll work next year. And of course, AI is and then instead of the thing that we thought would be AI coming about next year, it's like completely pervaded everything. Um, you know, it, it organizes your life. It searches out the algorithms are out there. Things that used to be, you know, uh, um, on the edge in terms of, um, the, of AI and VR are now completely normal. Uh, so whether and when, we'll have, um, it will be completely normal to sort of enter. A, 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 actually, I guess what I'm really thinking, and I, if I find this a bit disturbing, um, somebody, again, the brain computer interface, I think in some ways, it, it's really tricky to do this with electronics and screens and haptic devices. And the way to do it really is to plug it straight into your head so that you 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 the the interface goes right right straight in and grabs hold of your um perceptual system and goes straight into it uh, and that sounds a little bit scary to me but i can't imagine that's not where we will actually go um so that to perceive reality maybe it will be a little you sort of just click your tongue and now i'm in the virtual world and i'm back out into the real world and i think Already, you know, the, the, the line between real and virtual has always been blurred. I think it's been blurred since cave people drew, drew on walls. We've always been a little bit living in, our, in and out of our bodies and minds. Um, and I have always said this to students, like the, the, the instant they, they put chips out on the market that you stick into your brain to control things, get the chip because you'll get to the age of 90 and you won't be able to open a door unless you have a chip. Awesome, yeah. Um, thanks, Josephine. Um, on the, you know, uh, hawking the future chip um, for us all. But um, my question for you, and I'll just let this be the last question, is can you wanna talk about where your work is going now that you're retiring and what you, your plans are? We've talked a lot about your older work and um, and so where are you going? Okay, um, well, um, uh, sort of in two directions, but mostly I've been, the, the, the project Improvising Consciousness, I, I, I really am enamored by, by trying to imagine where our, our minds in our bodies go in a future, where the environment might degrade a lot more than it is now. So I'm actually writing a science fiction novel. Um, and that project, Improvising Consciousness, sort of in some ways 
serve as as all the back, you know, a lot of background and deep background and backstories for that project. So I've been doing that. And then sometimes I can't write that because you kind of get too close to it. Uh, and I, I want to mention in, in respect to that, that I work, um, that I have a writer's group. And I think if you're writing, you need a writer's group. And Margaret Ree, who is on in our department, uh, is also interested in science fiction and is in that writer's group. So that's very exciting. Um, but for some reason, at the same time, I also became very interested in the work of Thomas Piketty, who is actually an economist, <laughs> French economist. And he wrote all about um, the ways in which you know, he actually bases his work entirely in statistics and he showed statistically how since the 1980s, the rich have been just getting richer and richer and richer and the poor and the middle have been getting poorer and poorer. And, you know, this isn't brain surgery. You can actually change your taxation policies so this isn't the case. And um, this is sort of predicated on the notion that, you know, human beings make wealth and and some people rake all the wealth off the top. Um, so I've been making um, I've been making animation animations uh, using clay figures um, about economics. Great. Um, cool. So, um, so oh, and they're they're on my website, so anybody can go and look at them. Um, uh, so can I just ask the title, the working title of your of your science fiction novel? Oh, the working title is Tarraway, and it's just the name of the protagonist. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, well, coming to a, um, a, a, a Kindle near you. Um, <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Um, but thank you so much, Josephine, and uh, and thank you to the students for all of your questions. And um, and so uh, it was wonderful to hear you. Um, and uh, the um, we'll return with a public lecture in two weeks with uh, Almudena uh, Escobar Lopez, and uh, students will have a class next week all by themselves. Um, so thank you again, Josephine, and um, uh, thank you very much to you, Paige, and thank you, uh, famous, and thank you all, the students. It's been really fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. Good night, everyone. Bye.